today uh, we're going to pick up where we left off. And in the last class, we covered four points that Schaefer uh, prescribes for the church. Uh, number one, we should never come to differences with true Christians without regret. Um, this is one of those things I think we should carry with us. Although we understand the limits that we are in a fallen world and that uh, there's, we should expect disagreements and differences. However, when we approach these things, we still should have a matter of regret about us. Uh, first off, because that person's created in the image of God, but then also because there are fellow brothers and sisters. And so that uh, requires something of us. And it's, it's something that I believe the Holy Spirit will check us if we listen. And then number two, an appropriate response is needed. Now, when Schaefer talks about this appropriate response, he says that the more serious the wrong, the more holiness is needed. Okay? And then, secondly, the more serious the difference, the more seeking of the aid of the Holy Spirit to enable us to show love. So, uh, first we have that when we approach differences, we must not uh, approach those without regret. And then, secondly, we must have the appropriate response which means, means that whenever we approach a wrong, that we respond with the proper amount of holiness and the proper amount of seeking uh, the Holy Spirit's help through prayer. Okay, and so and he, his, you may remember from last week we talked about that Schaefer pointed out that we do exactly the opposite most times. Uh, whenever things get serious, uh, sometimes we uh, don't have quite the amount of holiness we need. Uh, maybe when they get, uh, you know, the, the differences get deeper, then we get harsher rather than getting more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. So that's the climate that we need to really engage in, especially as we deal with this, um, both on a practical level uh, in, in like the uh, you know family and in our relationships, but then also in the general concept of how we address the world and the things that we run into from time to time. Now, number three, he says, being willing to show a practical demonstration of love in the midst of a dilemma is required even when it's costly. And doing that when it's costly, I think, is, is speaks to the level of commitment we have to the Lord. Um, and so he says this may mean uh, suffering or being defrauded for the purpose of the gospel. And so he, you know, the, the scripture that I brought out was it talked about where Paul talks about us not going to uh, taking our brother to law. You know, but rather uh, consulting the church and uh, beginning to to properly undergo uh, negotiation with someone to help us and dealing with that so that it doesn't misrepresent the gospel before watching the world. Now, number four in this, he said uh, they were to approach the problem with a desire to solve it and not to win. Uh, so important on a daily basis that we begin to to take up that kind of thought, that it's about uh, trying to solve the situation rather than win it. And I think, you know, something else that we can throw in here that really supplements this, which Schaefer has talked about all along, is that we need the constant uh, attitude that follows the Holy Spirit in conflict. That we see conflict as rather something that is actually aiding in our sanctification. I think uh, Carrie posted on her Facebook wall talking about uh, some, you know, the, the battles of motherhood, you know, just all the things she had to overcome that day. The process of, of being a, a mother or being, being a parent or being a spouse are constant works of sanctification. And if we see them in light, that light, we begin to really thoroughly uh, grasp this concept of, uh, of God is actually using these situations for our good. And if we can get a hold of that, you will have a lot of victory. Now, this week we want to talk about his fifth point, and I'll just uh, just read this one here. Um, a fifth way in which we can show a practicing, observable love to the world without sharing our brother's mistake is to realize to keep consciously before us and to help each other to be aware that it is easy to compromise and to fall. I mean, to call what is wrong, right. But that is equally easy to forget to exhibit our oneness in Christ. And this attitude must be constantly and consciously developed. Talk about, talked about, and written about, 
and, and um, among our groups and among ourselves as individuals. So Schaefer begins to get into this fact that you know not only do we have to live it, but we have to begin to teach this. And let me point out some important aspects of this fifth concern. This fifth concern is to avoid the failure uh, in becoming consciously motivated, uh, really, at, at this point. Uh, we must avoid sharing our brother's mistake, and we need to realize that there are three ways that we can fall. There's three potential pitfalls. One, we can call uh, the fall, uh, I'm sorry, one, we can fall into error by being tempted in the same sin. Two, we can fall into error by not practicing love. Or three, we can fall into error by compromising truth. If we begin to think these things over each time that we are, you know, uh, come at conflict, it will aid us so much. Now, you know, it's one thing to take the class, but it's another thing to actually put it in practice in a, in a real situation. And, I, you know, it's, it's very easy. I found, too, in my own life, you know, you learn a concept and you even feel like you know it. Uh, you've known it your whole life, in fact. But it just somehow never quite touched the situation. And then when someone pointed out to you, like maybe a pastor or maybe a mentor, and says, hey, you know what? You really should apply this biblical principle to this situation. You're like, oh, yeah, I get that principle, but this situation? Oh, yeah, duh. And then all of a sudden, it's like you begin to put on this filter or this armor, if you will. And the filter is knowing to catch the question, take it captive before you act. And then you put on this armor that's going to protect you against what you could potentially do wrong in that situation. And then you begin to act on this source of truth that you have. The Spirit of God has guided you into all truth and He's given you truth. And so you apply it in that situation, put it between you and the conflict. And then it flows, this victory that can be won immediately when we respond. And what happens is over and over as we repeat this good thing, God works this wonderful work of the Spirit in our lives that we can feel a real true blessing because we've achieved a victory over something that constantly beset us. Uh, I can tell you in my life this has been such a wonderful thing because learning to catch those things that I know are my, my, my buttons, you know, and everybody has your buttons and usually your spouse knows exactly where they are. <laughs> So I tell you, specifically in the marriage situation, for whatever reason, God gives you people that can push your buttons because after a certain amount of time, they figure them out and then they push, and sometimes not even intentionally, but it happens and it transpires so that we can become more perfected. And so what we need to do is to grow and to realize that, guess what? God's given her or him the things that we need to be perfected. And so we need to respond to them, not in... Uh, getting upset, but with, with the proper attitude to take them on and allow us, ourselves to be perfected in, in Christ's righteousness. So, very important steps here, pitfalls, we, uh, are not to uh, be tempted by the person's sin that we're addressing. How many times have, uh, when you were young, I, at least I know when I was young, there were times when someone like, showed me something wrong and said, hey, let's go do this or whatever, and I was like, well, okay, if you're doing it, and then I just would go. And I would first be telling, no, that's wrong. But then he's like, ah, oh, come on, you're being too rich. And then we go, you know, whatever. So you have to stand up in that, in that uh, situation. And then also begin to practice love when you're correcting and, co and not compromise truth. Now, I really think that Schaefer asserts this point, really this fifth point here last, because it is at the, this point that we struggle and that we are apt to really cave in. Um, we, uh, we may have an approach, uh, we may have approached the situation with regret. We may have given the appropriate first uh, response. Uh, we may have demonstrated love, even when it was costly, like right up to the end. Uh, we may have approached the problem with a desire to solve it. We ha may have uh, been in the difficulty of this fight, though, and got to the very end, and we're struggling and struggling, and then all of a sudden, well, you know what, I'm just tired of fighting. You know, I mean, I'm just worn out. And we may have caved there right at the very end, and we shops, uh, really stopped short at really coming to what we needed to, to uh, solve the problem. And then we caved in one way or the other, uh, with compromising truth, compromising love, 
and that caused all kinds of problems for us. So these are the areas right now where when you get to that fifth point, you need to stop and begin to truly evaluate uh, what the condition is and how to respond. And uh, is, am I willing to see this through? Am I willing to take that costly step? And so uh, now in order to experience victory, we as a church need to constantly be practicing truth and love, but also speaking and teaching it. And so uh, as we get ready to close in, in the next uh, uh, lesson, this point is, it needs to be observed right here at the end, because we need to begin to practice teaching this to each other, not just learning it ourselves, not just applying it ourselves, but also talking and conversing about it. Uh, we cannot really let this be. To not take it up in discussion is really to miss our calling as believers. Now here's what Schaefer says. He says, this must be talked about and written about before differences arise between true Christians. So we have to begin to premeditate to obtain victory in this area. Uh, we have conferences about everything else Schaefer says. Uh, uh, who has ever heard of a conference to consider how true Christians can exhibit the practice of fidelity to the holiness of God? and yet simultaneously exhibit and practice a fidelity to love, the love of God before the watching world. I mean, we have all kinds of conferences, but how many do you see going on like this? This should be one of the main themes. Um, so really, if this is so important, if this is truly the mark of a Christian, uh, practicing love and truth in a way that presents the gospel to the watching world, that's a demonstration, the final apologetic for watching the world, then why are we not having conferences about it? Why do we not get this point utterly solid as a church before we do anything else? How odd it is that this great apologetic not being discussed to the degree that so many other things are. Um, we have to, uh, to honestly ask, uh, where is this sort of apologist in our day? And I know of a few, but, I, but I'm saying it needs to be, it needs to be more. Uh, Schaefer says here, Have you heard of sermons or writings which carefully present the simultaneous practice of two principles, which at first seem to work against each other? One, the principle of the practice of the purity of the visible church in regard to doctrine and life, and two, the principle and practice of observable love and oneness among all true Christians. Next quote, when they see differences among true Christians who also show an observable unity, this will open the way for them to consider the truth of Christianity and Christ's claim that the Father did send the Son. Remember, we're in John 17, the pastoral prayer by Jesus himself. Make us one Father, is what he's saying. And make us one so that they will know that you have sent me. That's the concept. And that's the concept here that Schaefer's uh, ending it. Now next, the love and practice. Schaefer wants to give us some examples of what things that he's seen. And he gives us two. And one of them we'll cover today, and the next one we'll cover in the final class. But Schaefer begins to share several examples of this type of love and practice. The first is a story of the brethren, Church of the Brethren, in Nazi Germany. In order to control the church, Hitler commanded the union of all religious groups in Germany and half submit to that order and half did not in the Breton Church. After the war, the two groups were faced with reuniting. And how were they supposed to do this? Well, Schaefer uh, talked to them. The time was appointed when the elder of the uh, elders of the two groups could meet together in a certain quiet place. And I asked the man who told me this, what did you do? And he said, well, I tell you what we did. We came together and we set aside several days in which each man would search his own heart. Now, the man telling Schaefer the story told him plainly of the difficulties and emotion, uh, the emotional tension really, that he, he was faced with. He said, my father uh, has gone to the concentration camp and my mother was dragged away. Schaefer says, these things are not just little pebbles on the beach. They reach into the deep wellsprings of human emotion. But these people understood the command of Christ about this. And for several days, every man did nothing except search his own heart concerning his own failures and the command of Christ that they met together. Then they met together. And I asked the man, what happened? 
Schaefer says. And he said, uh, we just were one. So they just set everything aside and they became one. And Schaefer says, to my mind, this is exactly what Jesus speaks about. The Father has sent the Son. That's the demonstration, because you see people against all odds that shouldn't have been able to come together, come back together at all. But because of Christ, they were able to unify again because they were able to overlook offenses and they were able to deal with the, the rightful offenses as well on a personal basis. And there was a discussion, there was prayer, there was a, a real solid attempt at uh, resolving the conflict. And we can look back at the history of uh, many of the splits in the church and wonder, well, were they taking this level of devotion? I, just, I think this is a wonderful story. And as he says, in my mind, this is exactly what Jesus is talking about. The Father sent the Son. It's, it's a visible demonstration. Now, this is why I, I say that the final apologetic is, is without refutation. When you look at that story, what person, even a non-Christian, can look at that story and say, those people are not Christians after what they just did? I mean, what person can, can look at that and say, oh, you guys do not practice rightful Christian love? I mean, my, my father was taken to the concentration camps. My mother was dragged away to do God knows what with her. I was an orphan, and yet we came back together in spite of that. That's, that's truth and love and practice in a wonderful, profound way. And that's really what Schaefer's getting.